Hi, and in this video, what I'm going to do is what I'm going to call a Regents Physics midterm review. In other words, I'm going to go over any question from the June 2024 Regents exam that is related to mechanics. Now, mechanics is something you're going to study probably beyond the midterm. And let's take a look at the reference tables. Here is the front page or page one of the physics reference tables. And you see a lot of constants here that we may or may not be using for mechanics. And the big page is going to be the back page of the reference table. Here are all your equations related to mechanics. And there could be a few more that pop up when we're going through some of these questions. So back to the Regents exam and back to a review of mechanics. Before we get started, I highly recommend you have a calculator, obviously your reference tables, and um, a pen and a piece of paper, because you're gonna wanna go through these. Please don't do them in your head. I, I think that's a big mistake. That's my own personal opinion. That's entirely up to you. With that, let's check out question one. Now, question one has to do with whether or which of these quantities here is a vector. You're supposed to know what a vector in a scalar is, not necessarily related to electricity yet. You'll get to that in the second half of the course. A vector, of course, you have magnitude and direction, where if you have a scalar, it's magnitude only. The answer here is choice one, all fields, gravitational field, electric field, magnetic field, etc., have direction. The question two, what is the magnitude? So again, here we just need the number. We don't need direction of the eastward component of the velocity of an airplane flying at. You got 612 kilometers per hour in the direction 40 degrees north of east. Big time, what could help you is a picture. So if I have, of course, north, south, East and west, right? Here's east, here's north, south, and west. Magnitude of the eastward component. So it's north of east. In other words, the plane is north, 40 degrees north of east, right here. If I draw it again, here's my 40 degrees, okay? And this is east, north of east. We want to know the magnitude of this vector right here, right? Eastward component. And what we're given is we're given the hypotenuse or the 612 kilometers per hour. What do I have to do? I have to break it up. Of course, this is a 90 degree angle. Think trig, right? Sokotoa. And I need the angle adjacent to this angle, all right? And I have the hypotenuse. So, so, ka, toa. Again, I have the hypotenuse and I want adjacent. That's gonna be the cosine of, oops, cosine of 40 degrees is equal to the adjacent, which is our x over the 612. Now, make sure your calculator is in degrees. Stop the video and actually calculate the answer. Sure enough, my calculator was radian, so I had to switch it. And when I take the cosine of 40 and then I multiply it by 612, I get an answer of choice 2, 469 kilometers per hour. For question 3, a car initially traveling at 25 meters per second is uniformly brought to rest as the brakes are applied over a distance of 40 meters. Now, velocity, sometimes students will get confused. There's a couple of different velocities. There could be an initial velocity. There could be a final velocity. There could be an average velocity, for example. You gotta read the question. You have initially traveling. 25 meters per second is a VI. It's brought to rest. 
that's the final velocity then is going to go from 25 down to zero. The distance is 40 meters. Notice what I'm doing here in a really lousy handwriting is writing everything down. The magnitude of the average acceleration of the car while braking is. So I'm looking for A, okay? Um, acceleration is the change in velocity over time. Problem is I don't have the time. Let's take a look at the reference tables. I'm sure by the time that you're getting ready for a midterm or a big test on mechanics, you've dealt with these first five equations a lot. Now remember what we have. We have VF, we have VI, we have D. And what are we looking for? We're looking for A. Go ahead, go through your equations, and here we have VF squared is equal to VI squared plus 2AD. That will work. Now, what makes physics so hard is you have to, of course, diagnose the, the question, right? Figure it out. You could list your variables, use the words, and use the units to figure out and label. Then you have to find the correct equation. Then you have to make sure you're plugging it in correctly and then using your calculator in order of operations, of course, to get the correct answer. This is where the paper and pen are so important because if you don't write it down, you can make a mistake. Your final velocity is zero, it's brought to rest. Your initial velocity is 25 meters per second, but remember you got that square. So either put it as 25 times 25 or put the square in um, 25 in parentheses and the square on the outside. All right, we're looking for A and our D is 40 meters. Now we have to solve for A. First thing we're gonna do, again, order of operations. All right, so I have zero is equal to 625 just squared the 25 plus 80A. Now let's get the 625 over to the other side. And we do that, we get a negative 625. Now don't fear the negative here in physics, and I'll explain in a second. So negative 625 is equal to 80 times A. What do I have to do? I have to divide both sides by 80. And when I go ahead and do that, 625 divided by 80, and I get a negative 7.81, and that's meters per second squared, and that's our answer. Now you go, wait a minute, this is negative. Why? Because the car is decelerating. That's negative acceleration. The question asked you for the magnitude. That's why you can use absolute value, and that's why choice three is the answer. These next three questions are about information and not necessarily calculating anything. Let's take a look. In number four, a brick starts from rest and falls freely from the top of the building to the ground. I literally draw it, right? Here's my brick. It's going this way. Anytime anything is in free fall, remember it's under the influence of gravity. And what is gravity? Gravity is acceleration. Let's watch the wording here. As the brick falls, it's acceleration. The acceleration stays constant, but what's happening is the speed is increasing, which is choice three. For number five, which object has the greatest inertia? Your inertia, right? That's when an object is at rest, it tends to stay at rest unless influenced by um, an, an outside force or an object in motion tends to stay in motion, blah, blah, blah. Okay, well, guess what? Don't look at velocity. It has everything to do with the mass of the object, which in this case, the greatest is gonna be our truck. And then finally, for number six, I'm looking at an unbalanced force. When you deal with forces, there is an equation, let me show you this, that we know, of course, as F is equal to MA. For whatever reason, on this reference table, that's why I wanted to show you, they have it as A is equal to F net over M. When your net force is equal to zero, what that means is you have your forces balanced. 
two conditions. You have an object at rest or you have an object moving at a constant velocity. If you have an F net, a number that is not zero, now what you have is you have accelerated motion. I don't know why New York State, when they put these tables together, had put it in this form, but they did. But it's just good old F is equal to MA, as far as I'm concerned. Let's go back. Again, on balance force, now you do have acceleration. If you have acceleration, you have a change in velocity slash speed, which is choice three. Remember, we're dealing with mechanics. We're skipping seven. We're going to eight. We have a ball thrown from level ground at an angle of 55 degrees above the horizontal. So here's my horizontal. Here's my 55 degrees. And it says it lands on level ground. So it's doing one of those. Neglecting friction if the ball is thrown again at the same angle, but with a larger initial speed, the ball will travel. Well, so my V, let's say my original V is 20 meters per second. And now I have a new V and it's double, it's 40 meters per second. What is that going to mean as far as Let's run again at the same amount the ball will travel. All right. Will it travel higher and the same distance horizontally? It's a two-part question. Is it going higher and is it going further? Now, it's going to do both because the hypotenuse, in this case, I doubled it just to, to show it, but it's going to be... Um, higher as far as your uh, dy and further downrange as far as your dx. You could solve for it mathematically. And I want to show you how we would do that. And we can use, of course, the equations on the reference table. Right here, you see an equation for ay and ax. What this is, is this is the trig broken up into the X and Y component. The X being horizontal and the Y being your vertical. How high it's going to go and how far down it's going to go. If you're not sure, then what you would do is you would set up this, these two equations twice and come up with a number like I did, where your vector quantity, right, you start out with 20 meters per second, and go through and calculate the y and the x component at the 55 degree angle and then you do it double 40 and look at the numbers and the numbers will tell you you can also just draw the picture but it is here you're dealing with two directional motion because you have your horizontal and your vertical and remember that your horizontal is one direction but your vertical you have the projectile going up and coming down and that entire time, remember, it's under the influence of gravity. If I didn't say it, the answer then for 8 is choice 3. Checking out question 10. What is the weight of a 60 kilogram student on the surface of the earth? Everything on, on the earth is affected by gravity. We're really dealing with FG, or force, force due to gravity. In other words, our weight is equal to mg. My m is my 60, and my g is my 9.81 meters per second squared. Now, a lot of physics teachers just take acceleration due to uh, gravity and just round it to uh, 10. You could do that, but based on the choices, that's not going to work here. Use your calculator and get your answer. And your answer is 589. In an 11, you have 120 Newton box. Remember, Newton is a unit of force pulled by a 48 Newton horizontal force across a horizontal surface at a constant velocity. Coefficient of kinetic friction between the box and the horizontal surface is. So we have a horizontal force or force applied of 48. Newtons. 
Now, we have 120 Newton box. That's the box's FG, right? Force due to gravity is 120. Let's check out the reference tables. Now, we're checking out the reference tables here, and I'm looking for something with forces. So I'm right here in the kind of the middle, if you will. And I do see something that has to deal with the coefficient of friction. And here it is. FF is equal to mu FN. But you might say to yourself, wait a minute, you said force applied, and then we said the weight. Well, let's go back. We'll check out the scenario, and we are going to use this equation. Now, the best thing to do for 11 is to draw yourself what's called a free body diagram. Sounds fancy. All it is is a little sketch. Here is my surface, not so horizontal, and here is my box. I have a 120 Newton box. My force due to gravity, in other words, my weight, also known as the normal force that should sound familiar to you, right? Gravity's always pulling down, man, is 120 Newtons. It's getting pulled by this horizontal force of the 48 Newtons. Here's the key. We're dealing with constant velocity. You have a balance of forces. I just messed up. Uh, this is not the normal force. This is force due to gravity because it's pulling down. This is the normal force. But these cancel out. Now, the reason why I knew I screwed up is because forces come in pairs. If my applied force is 48 newtons and my box is not accelerating, it's moving at constant velocity, the force due to friction has to also be 48. And that's the key of us finding out the coefficient of friction. I put the equation down. My force of friction is 48. My normal force is 120. And my mu is here. In other words, 48 divided by 120. And my answer is 0 0.4. Let's check out question 12. We have a box A and a box B. Box A has a mass of 10 kilograms and is at rest on a shelf. That is one and a half meters above the floor. Here's my floor. Here's my shelf. This is one and a half meters. And my box is 10 kilograms. Now be careful, it's 10 kilograms. It doesn't say 10 newtons. We're talking mass here with kilograms. Now, box B has a mass of 20 kilograms and is at rest on the shelf, and it is three meters above the floor. Now, when I was teaching physics and I'd walk around and I'd see kids doing these types of problems in their head, I don't know how. I personally always need a picture. If you think you're a visual learner, just jot some stuff down. Now, it says compared to box A, which was our 10, box B has a gravitational potential energy relative to the floor that is. Now, gravitational potential energy, let's go to the reference tables. When we're dealing with energy, main forms of mechanical energy, potential energy, and kinetic energy. Potential energy, of course, is the stored energy, and kinetic energy is the energy of motion. You already knew that. You didn't need me to tell you. I'm sure you knew it when you walked in the door. Now, on this reference table, you see PE with a little S. That's potential energy of a spring. That's not going to work here, but here it is, our potential energy of position. So PE is equal to MGH, where M is the mass in kilograms. G is acceleration due to gravity, and of course, H is the height. Let's use that. You can reason it out, or personally, I would just go ahead and put it down on paper. Both of them would be under the influence of gravity. What are we looking at here then? We're looking at the mass, and we're looking at the height. For box A, we have 10 times g, but I'll leave that out, times 1.5. So that gives us a factor of 150. But let's check that to box B. For box B, 
we have double the mass, so it's 20. Again, we're leaving g off and double the height, which is 3. I'm sorry. 10 times 1.5 is 15. Use your calculator. All right, that was a hiccup in my brain. What's 20 times 3? That's 60. 15 into 60, four times. So in other words, the potential energy for box B is four times as great. Again, the, the main lesson here, use your calculator. Next question in 13, we have a 0.1 kilogram yo-yo twirled at the end of the length of string in a horizontal circular path. We're given a radius and we're given a speed and we're asked about the magnitude of the centripetal acceleration. There are two equations we need to check out. Let me show you where they are and we'll come back and solve the question. Under the mechanics equations again, here you see Centripetal force is equal to mass times the um, centripetal acceleration, and then a centripetal acceleration is equal to v squared over r. Let me just make sure we go over a picture here. My yo-yo is traveling in a circle, right? We have our velocity vector. We have our, um, which it's changing direction as we go around. We have our r. And then the other thing is we could substitute V squared R into a C. In other words, FC is equal to M V squared over R. You can do it in one step. You can do it in two step. Usually the Regents is going to ask you about this. Let's check it out. With both equations together. We can solve for centripetal acceleration. Hold on. I just realized I made this more complicated than it needs to be. We're given the speed and we're given the radius. We can just use this equation. Six meters per second squared don't forget the square, 6 times 6 is 36, divided by our radius of 0.8. And we get an answer of 45. Let's move to 14 here. And 15. For 14, a 4 kilogram mass is initially at rest on a horizontal frictional surface. A constant 2 newton force to the east is applied to the mass for a 5 second interval. As a result of this action, the mass acquires a... All right, I, I need a picture. Here's my horizontal surface, and here's my mass. It's 4 kilogram mass. Remember, it's kilograms, not newtons. Constant 2 newton force to the east is applied for 5 seconds. Here's my 2 newton force and it's five seconds. As a result of this action, the mass acquires A. Well, it's definitely going to be moving east, and it's frictionless. We don't have to worry about that. So I have my F, I have my M, and I have a T. And we're dealing either with velocity or momentum. Well, checking it out. Of course, they have F is equal to MA. But that's not going to give me velocity or momentum, right? It was talking about either the velocity or the momentum being 10. I know it's going to the east because the force applied is to the east. Here is momentum. Momentum is given the lowercase p, and it's m times v, but I don't know the momentum, but I do know right here this equation that the change in momentum is equal to f net times t, and that's the key. My net force 
is the two newtons. The time applied is five seconds. Two times five is 10. So sure enough, we're talking momentum. That makes the correct answer choice three. For 15, we have a motor lifting a 1.2 times 10 to the 4 Newton elevator, 9 meters in 15 seconds. The minimum power output of the motor is, well, here we have, of course, a force. We have a distance and we have time. And we're looking for power. Power is given the uppercase P. Let's check out the reference tables. Here is your power equation. And really just like the change in momentum one that we just looked at in the other question, we can mix and match what's on either side of the equal sign depending on what we're given in the problem. We were given force, distance, and time. We're gonna need this version is equal to P. Now we have our force. That's our 1.2 times 10 to the fourth. Could take it out of scientific notation if you want. Let the calculator do it for you. That's going to be times 9 and divided by 15. Use your calculator. And when you do that, you'll find the answer for 15 is 2. We're checking out question 17 now. Remember, we're just dealing with mechanics. We have a wood block pulled at a constant velocity across a horizontal wood floor. Which type of energy increases in this block force system as the block moves? Now, remember it's at constant velocity, which means no change in acceleration. It's on a horizontal wood floor. That's not gonna change the gravitational potential energy. Kinetic is one half mv squared. It's constant velocity, that's not changing. Mechanical is the addition of these two, plus you're gonna lose some, right, to the surroundings. That's anytime you have two surfaces, that are in contact with one another when one or both are moving, you're gonna end up with friction and you're gonna end up with thermal energy, which is our answer here for choice four. Skipping 18 and going to 19, I have a 0.14 kilogram lacrosse ball. It's traveling west, 17 meters per second is brought to rest with a 0.21 kilogram lacrosse stick. If the force applied by the lacrosse stick on the ball is 220 newtons east. What is the force applied by the ball on the stick? Right, this is uh, Newton's third law of motion. Right, for every force, it's gotta be equal opposite force. And in this case then, if the force applied stick on ball is 220, then ball on stick is 220. It's just in 180 degrees in the opposite direction, which for 19 would be choice four. We're up to going through 20 questions here regarding mechanics uh, for the physics regents. We're gonna skip question 20, but I do, do wanna point out that most of the questions so far, you've needed your calculator to go ahead and come up with the answer. Very few questions are gonna be just reasoning questions. And if you notice, physics questions are tough because they're not just spewing back the facts. You really have to go through the question and read and reread it in order to formulate what your answer is gonna be. All right, let's check out 22 here. We have a mass sliding across a frictionless surface, so we don't have to worry about that with speed vi. The mass strikes a spring at position A, causing the spring to compress. When the mass is at position B, Now the key with this question is it ended up moving at a slower speed. It did not go down to zero. If it went down to zero, then all of that kinetic energy, right, the energy of motion would have went into the potential energy of the spring. And that's why the answer is choice one. Only some of the kinetic energy is converted into elastic potential energy. Hey, good job if you're still with me here and going through these questions with me. We are up to question 26, and we have an object that is thrown, thrown vertically upward with initial velocity of. In other words, draw yourself a picture, right? We're going this way, and the initial velocity, just to throw you off, happens to be VI 9.81 
meters per second. Now, of course, they use that number to confuse you. Why? Acceleration due to gravity, which is always pulling down, is 9.81 meters per second squared. Right? Uh, they, New York State loves to throw in kind of these little wrinkles. Well, we're looking for the max height. We're looking for D. The good news is we're only going in one direction as far as our, uh, literally, that was dumb, as far as our direction goes. So VF at the top of flight is always zero. Now, one other thing to add. If we're going to have our initial velocity as positive, that means the upper direction, then acceleration due to gravity, little g, is going to be a negative 9.81 meters per second squared. We're looking for d. Let's check out the reference table. We're using the same equations here that would, we would use with horizontal motion, right? Except now we're vertical up and down. We're looking for D. We don't have T. We can't use that. We don't have T again. We don't have T. Here's what we're solving for D. We don't have T. Here's our, our winner, winner, chicken dinner. Our final velocity we have as zero. We have our initial velocity. We have acceleration and we can solve for D. Let's go do that. I've already written the equation down. I would recommend that also for you on your piece of paper with your calculator. My final velocity is zero. My initial velocity is my 9.81. But remember, it's squared. If you find you're making mistakes and forgetting the square, then you could always just write 9.81 times 9.81 instead of here as squared, all right? plus two times, now, a negative 9.81 times D. Now, you can't just arbitrarily disappear negatives and positives. I had students that would always do that. You can't do that. And this negative sign is going to help us actually solve for D, as you'll see in a second. I'm running out of room. Oh, that means coffee's done. I'll get that in a minute. But I'm going to go ahead and continue up here. I have 0 is equal to 9.81 times 9.81 is essentially 96 plus 2 times a negative 9.81. That's a negative 19.62D. I'm going to bring the 96 over to the other side, which means I have to subtract it from both sides. What did I do here? Oh, sorry about this. I have 96 plus a negative 19.62 times D. Again, I'm subtracting 96 from both sides and negative 96 is equal to a negative 19.62 times D. Of course, the negatives now I can make those positives, and all I'm going to do is divide both sides by 19.62. Of course, on this side, we're going to get D alone, and we got to use our trusty, rusty calculators here. 96 divided by 19.62, you get 4.89, essentially 4.9, and if you look at 26, the only answer could be is choice two. If you're having problems with the math, if you get the setup correctly, but then you have problems getting the answer, then it's an algebra problem and not a physics problem. If you need any help with anything, you could always add a question in the comments and I can help you as best I can. Checking out question 28, we have a 7.5 kilogram object moving at 20 meters per second and strikes a 60 kilogram object initially at rest on a horizontal frictionless surface. Draw yourself that picture. Here's my surface. I have my 7.5 kilogram object 
I got my 60. This is 60 is at rest, and the 7.5 is going to go ahead and it's moving at 20 meters per second. It says the two objects stick together and move off at a speed of. Well, I think we can agree if you have a 60 kilogram object that gets slammed by a seven and a half, they're gonna move in the same direction, but obviously they're gonna slow down. Remember the momentum before is equal to the momentum after. And what we need to do is to go ahead and momentum is equal to mass times velocity. And we, we're going to go ahead and, and set that up. Alrighty. So let me go ahead and get rid of this picture. And we'll do just that. Just checking out the reference table, right? Our mechanics equations. If we go ahead and we scroll down here and we're looking for our momentum equations I already mentioned momentum before is equal to momentum after. Well, what does that mean? I have two objects. They each have a momentum, and that momentum is mass times velocity. When they collide and stick together, it's going to be the total mass and the total velocity after they've collided together. Let's check that out with the question. I've set it up here, 7.5 kilograms, it's going 20 meters per second. The other one is 60 kilograms, but it's at rest. It's a big fat zero. I didn't even have to draw it in, but I wanted to do that so you see it. On the other side now, we have to add the 60 and the 7.5 or 67.5 kilograms and now we're looking for that new V. At this point, it's just a good old math problem. I have my 7.5 and literally take it in steps like I'm saying here sometimes when students try to get ahead of themselves and they're plugging everything in their calculator, it's easy to make a mistake. So you write it down a little bit more. What's the difference? 7.5 times 20, you're gonna get 150. 60 times zero is zero. So it's 150 is equal to 67. 0.5 times V. I need to divide both sides by 67.5. Oops, sorry about that. I want to get that out of there. Divide both sides by 67.5. And when I do that, I get an answer of 2.2 meters per second. And there it is. Next up is question 34, velocity of an object, uniform circular motion. Draw yourself your circle, right? When you have an object that's in circular motion, the direction of V is always changing. The magnitude is constant, right? Because it's uniform circular, but it is a changing direction, which is choice one. We're checking out question 39. Which statement describes an object with constant kinetic energy? When you go back and you look at the mechanics reference table, kinetic energy is equal to one half mv squared. If your speed is constant, your kinetic energy is going to be constant and obviously your mass as well. If we take a look at the choices here, for choice one, a car is accelerating. That means you have a change in speed. For, for choice two, a runner decreasing her speed. That's a change in speed. For number three, that's your constant speed. That's gonna be our answer. And then for number four, if you have a sled going down a frictionless steep straight hill, then of course it's picking up speed. That's changing speed. So the answer is choice three. Checking out question 40, which phrase describes a box at, in equilibrium? If you have equilibrium when it comes to forces, your F net 
is going to be equal to zero. And that happens if you have an object and it's stationary or you have an object moving at a constant speed. For choice one, the elevator slowing down, that's not at equilibrium. For number two, you have a box at rest on the stationary table, there's your answer. For three, you have a box sliding down again. So again, you have uh, an F net, can't be choice three, and a box in free fall, of course. You have accelerated motion, it can't be choice four. For 40, the answer is two. All right, we're checking out questions 45 and 46. You have an experiment done by students and they are measuring the acceleration of a freely falling object. One student dropped an object from rest. Your VI, of course, is equal to zero. And the other student measured the distance fallen and the corresponding time of fall. So we have our D, we also have our T. And we're asked to calculate the acceleration. Well, acceleration due to gravity is 9.81 meters per second squared, which would indicate that unless they're doing this on the moon or somewhere else in the universe, the answer should be two, which is the closest one. But remember, this is their experimental value. So you do wanna go through it and see what you get. You go to the first five equations and you're looking for uh, what's gonna give you this plus solve for A. And of course, it's going to be um, D is equal to V the I T plus one half A T squared. And we're gonna solve for A. If you pick the right equation and you don't get the right answer, then again, you have a algebra problem and not a physics problem. Let's put in the numbers now. So 2.4 is equal to, well, it's starting at rest. So the first part is zero and then it's one half R A times 0.71 squared. So double the 2.4, bringing the, the uh, one half, multiplying both sides by two, get 4.8, and then you're gonna divide that by 0.71 and 0.71 again, and your answer will be the 9.5 meters per second squared. For 46, the ideal value for the acceleration differs from the one obtained experimentally by the students. Which one of these could be the possible cause of this discrepancy? The object was given some initial horizontal velocity. Well, it didn't say that they threw it. It said the object was dropped from rest. I don't think that would be a problem. Force of gravity much stronger on the outside than in the building. And they, no, that's silly. Motion formula should not be used in experimental setting, that's silly. And of course, it's going to be errors regarding the measurement, which is choice four. For question 47, you're asked which graph represents the motion of an object fally, falling freely from rest near the surface of the moon. Well, moon does have gravity. It's just not the same as the earth. It's a lot less, but it still does. So that means any object that's in free fall is still, still accelerated motion, right? It's gonna still get pulled down to the surface. And since it's accelerating, that means that the velocity is increasing and so is the distance. Now the D versus T, the V versus T, and the A versus T graphs, I do think that you should know. And I'm pretty sure I have a separate video on that. But in this case, we have an acceleration, which means that the, if this is A versus T, acceleration is constant. That means V versus T, it's a diagonal, and D versus T, it's going to go ahead and it's gonna be a curve, which is choice three. For 48, the diagram below represents initial velocities for four identical projectiles launched from ground level at various angles above the horizontal, which will have the longest time of flight. Now, you, if you recall now, we have our X and our Y. So we have two dimensions here, and then in the Y, we have two directions. In other words, in the Y, we have something that's going up, 
and then it's going to come down. And in the X, it's going across. We can go ahead and break up the hypotenuse here of each of these vectors with the equations that are on the reference table. Let me just show you that. So for the projectiles, right, on an angle from the horizontal, here are the two equations, and we're interested in Ay is equal to A sine theta. Let's go back. Now, you've already probably spotted that the greater the angle up to 90 degrees, the longest time of flight. Because if something is, is just shot straight up, it's going to come straight down, which is 90 degrees. More than likely, then, choice 4 is going to be our answer because 60 degrees. However, we do have choice 2 where our initial velocity is 10 meters per second. If you want to go th through it, we can. Here, Ay for choice 2 is going to be 10 times the sine of 45 degrees. And for choice 4, Ay is going to be equal to 9 times the sine of 60 degrees. For the first calculation, it's going to be 10 times 0.707. That's the sine of 45. So 7.07 .07 will be the initial velocity being shot straight up. And for choice 4, the sine of 60 is 0.866. And then we're going to multiply that by 9. And when we do, we get an answer of 7.8 or 7.79 and that is then why choice 4 is the answer. Checking out question 49. Four forces act on a crate on a level floor as shown in the diagram below. At the instance shown the crate is, well we're trying to figure out what's going on with the motion of the crate. Right? Forces work in pairs. So, so the normal force or the support force and force due to gravity, they're canceling one another out. But we do have an F net when it comes to applying a force to the right and the force of friction working 180 degrees in the opposite direction. My F net then, of course, is 100 minus 50, which is 50. So we're still applying a force on this box and since we have an F net of 50 the mass isn't changing but we do have an acceleration so the box is going to be accelerating in the same direction as F net which is to the right or choice one looking at question 50 now there are 50 multiple choices this is the very last question and you can pretty much tell there's a lot of mechanics on the Regents exam. And that's why when you're studying for your midterm, you might not even be through all of the mechanics. And again, whatever you haven't covered yet, I would just go ahead and skip and worry about that later. All right, so we have a graph here. It's showing the relationship between the potential energy stored in a spring and how much that spring has been stretched. And we're asked about what is the value of the spring constant. Well, let's check out the reference tables for the equation, and we'll come on back. We're checking out these two equations. Force of the spring is equal to Kx, and then the potential energy in the stored spring is equal to 1 half Kx squared. We're going to bring them back and then figure out how to answer the question. We're using here the second equation because we have potential energy and x. It is, as you can see looking at the equation, direct squared relationship, and that's why it's a curve. Let's use the point here and plug it in, see what we get for k. Substituting in, it's 0.2 is equal to 1 half k uh, times 0.04 squared. 
Grab that calculator. I'm doing the same right now. And let's take a look. So it's, again, it's 0.2. Now I'm bringing one half over to the other side. I'm multiplying each side by two. So 0.2 times two, that's 0.4. And now I gotta bring 0.04 squared over or I can divide 0.4 by 0.04 twice, right? Because 0.04 squared is the same as 0.04 times 0.04. And let's do that. And I get an answer of choice four or 250 Newton divided by meters. All right, the other parts of the test are gonna be your short answer. Remember, we're looking and focusing on, in on mechanics questions, which starts with question 53-54. Anytime you're dealing with calculating an answer, you have to show your work, you have to put the equation down, you have to plug in with units and provide an answer with units. If you don't do that, you're not gonna get full credit. Typically, these questions are worth two points a piece. And as a matter of fact, that's why you see, I'm gonna just make this a little bigger. That's why you see it's 53-54. Very important that you practice it exactly how you would do it on the test, whether it's a midterm, a regular test in physics, or for the Regents exam. Let's take a look. We have a toy car initially traveling at one meter per second, uniformly accelerates to a speed of four meters per second down a five meter long slope. Calculate the time for the uh, toy car to travel five meters from the top of the slope to the bottom. We're looking for T. Well, what do we have? We have a VI, we have a VF, we have a D, and we know of course that it is accelerating as it's going down the track. See, here's the key. The two here means two points, and all of this information is what you have to show when it comes to getting credit for both points. Checking out our classic five motion equations here. We're trying to figure out how to answer that question. We can't assume, folks, that we're just talking acceleration due to gravity, or little g, 9.81, as our acceleration, right? It's in this car. It did not say it, you know, it was just getting, it was getting pulled down by the force of gravity. We don't have A. We're looking for T. But we have our VI, our VF, and our D. That makes this very first equation a great candidate. Now, what's not listed here is what I always called it V-bar means. That's average velocity. How do I get the average? Real simple. It's going to be your initial velocity plus your final velocity divided by 2. That's going to give us the average velocity. We then go ahead and use the second equation, D over T, and we got it. Now, before we leave this, you could have done it or do it a different way. All right, we have VF, VI, and D. You could use this equation, for example. Oh, hold on, I'm trying to do it in a different color. This equation, solve for A, and then maybe use this equation and get T. Totally legit. There's more than one way to answer it. Work with what works best for you. Let's go back. I just wrote down the first equation here. My initial velocity is one. My final is four. They're going in the same direction, so I don't have to worry about signs. Oh, it's plus, not times. Divided by two. So one plus four is five. Five divided by two is two and a half. So that's our average speed. Now we're gonna use that this average speed is equal to D over T. So two and a half meters per second, our D is five, and we're solving for T. Right algebraically, what do I have to do? Multiply both sides by 
t and then divide both sides by two and a half. Now, I'm making the mistake I just told you not to make, and I apologize. And that is, I go ahead, I get my answer, and my answer here is gonna be five divided by two and a half, which is gonna be two, and I leave it. I'm not gonna get full credit. Why? Because I did not substitute in the units. And yes, you have to do it for everything. Putting that, let's say, in a different color, one meter per second, four meters per second, I get two and a half meters per second as my average. Over here, two meters per second is equal to five meters divided by T, and then T is equal to two seconds. Now I'll get full credit. Again, when you're, when you're out of practice or you've never practiced it, you could make a silly mistake and lose points. You don't want to do that. Make sure you're substituted with units after putting down whatever equations you're using. For every equation, plug in the numbers with the units. Checking out question 57. We have motion of a car that's traveling along a uh, straight road in the graph. We have speed versus time. Determine the average speed of the car from t is equal to zero to t is equal to eight seconds. Since this is a v versus t graph, we do have to be careful. Let me just review what we have going on. For a v versus t, the slope is going to give you acceleration. That gives you a. Any area under whatever the lines have been drawn will give you your distance or displacement. Average speed, here we're back to V bar again. Average speed is gonna be D over T, but the equation that isn't there is that average speed is also equal to VI plus VF divided by two. We're looking at the zero to eight second segment here. So at zero, the speed is four. At eight, the speed is 10. Now, they didn't, uh, it's only a one point question. They're not looking for the equation and substituting in with units. Uh, so you don't have to worry about that here, but I would do it that way all the time. So you don't have to worry about when, it, when you're using it and when you're not, right? The average speed then is equal to four meters per second plus 10 meters per second divided by two. Four plus 10 is 14. 14 divided by two, and we get an answer of seven meters per second for 57. Oops, sorry about that. For uh, 58, 59, it says calculate, oh, the magnitude of the acceleration of the car from T is equal to zero, T is equal to eight seconds. Now you have to show all the work um, associated with that. Let's erase this and we'll get down to business. I already mentioned your acceleration is going to be your slope. And what is a slope? Slope is the change in y over the change in x. You would have to write that down. So the change in y over from the eight seconds to zero, we have 10 meters per second minus four meters per second. And that's gonna be divided by eight seconds minus zero seconds Right, so 10 minus four, we're gonna get six, six over eight. When you go ahead and plug it into the calculator, you're gonna get an answer now of 0 0.75, but don't leave it like that. It's meters per second squared because it is an acceleration. For 64, 65, we're dealing with a spring again and we have our two equations associated with that. And in this question, we're given that the uh, initial length of the spring is the 0.2 meters, 
And now with the block on it, it's stretched, it's stretched rather to 0.5 meters. We're also given the spring constant of 250 newtons per meter. What are we asked about? We're asked about what is the force exerted by the block on the spring. Again, equation, substituting in with units, answer with units. I wrote down both equations, but we're asked to calculate the magnitude of the force, which is going to be this first equation here. We have the spring constant, which is K, and we have X, right? Which is gonna be the difference of where the spring started versus where it ended. In other words, 0.5 minus 0.2, which is 0.3 meters. Fs is equal to Kx. Fs is equal to 250 newtons divided by meters times 0.3 meters. Of course, I'm going to grab my calculator here. And I get an answer of 75 newtons. As it turns out, that's the last question from the mechanics unit for the 2024 June physics regents exam. I hope you got something out of it. Practice over and over again. You've got this, but take your time. Check out all the variables. Find equations you think will work. Don't just fit things in because you know you need a number. Actually think and come up with a plan before you go ahead and solve for the answer. Always good luck.